to the board for taking some time uh, to hear from me today. Um, I'm it, this is a really cool opportunity for me. Um, I've been a working with Jen for a, a large number of years and been familiar with with PNAM before we started the work on the International Year of the Salmon. And I think my message um, is pretty simple, um, that after the work we've been doing for the last four years, uh, five years and more on the International Year of the Salmon, which has really been an exercise in trying to do what PNAP is already doing in the lower 48. Um, and that's to bring people together in a partnership to uh, realize that uh, some of the parts uh, is a heck of a lot more than the individual uh, pieces in terms of what you can accomplish. And in a changing world um, under climate change, which uh, is really hitting us between the eyes, and I know all of you will have extensive sort of <clears throat> personal experience now with what climate change is doing to us and, and to our organizations and to our resources, um, that it really, um, it's not longer just a nice to have, this ability to collaborate, do things faster, share data, share methods is really essential. And our, our year of the salmon um, really was a timely, it happened, you know, was was at a time when the heat waves hit in the North Pacific. And all of this became obvious to a lot more, you know, sort of our collective um, understanding. And so I think you guys are are actually way ahead. Like a lot of us look and go, oh man, if in our jurisdiction, if we could be part of or had what uh, PNAMP is doing. And I know talking, um, thanks to Steve and uh, Ken and Nancy and, um, and uh, others that have been so open to talking to us, that what you guys are doing is of interest to the whole Northern Hemisphere and folks that are doing similar things. And the way you're doing it, I think, is a model. And so my talk, or I've t entitled it The Case for an International Aquatic Monitoring Partnership, uh, might be a bit cheeky, but not really. Um, I, I really think there there is a case. So I'm, I'm going to walk today through some of what we've learned, um, and, and you've already got my sort of high-level take um, from the International Year of the Salmon, um, and then talk and try to bring it more specifically back to uh, the partnership and how that that works and how we might move uh, have a discussion about how we might move forward so <clears throat> i think uh, as i said you know we're in this together there's no there's no question <laughs> this climate change is bringing us together <clears throat> i know it's really hard for people that are working in in <clears throat> excuse me excuse me in watersheds, fisheries, um, you know, and I was in that annual cycle that is intensely busy trying to get your, your, you know, uh, open fisheries, uh, get surveys conducted, get your data out, write a paper. Um, it's really hard to t find the time to say, hey, I don't have time to talk to uh, folks. And certainly our commission uh, working in the North Pacific uh, with five countries, Canada, the United States, Japan, Korea, and Russia, you know, the, our members are all busy. They find time, uh, find it hard to find time to do stuff um, within the commission ac across countries, uh, let alone going back six, seven years when we suggested we have an international year of the salmon and work with folks in the Atlantic. Um, and But when you take a look at, at what's in front of us, and these are some of the headlines that I picked up uh, we just track them, of course, as most of you, most groups do. Um, these are just last summers. Uh, there's another one that came out. I just saw an article coming out of Alaska talking about the crab fishery um, and the big uh, Alaska Marine uh, Science Conference that just wrapped up saying, you know, there's a borealization of the, the Bering Sea. So it's turning, it's not an Arctic uh, climate anymore. It's turning into a boreal climate and that's why you're losing losing crab and that's it's just uh stunning just uh you know um what what uh what we're into and what we're seeing um so it's no longer really i think an option just to sit back and wait to see what happens we need to try to work together to understand what's taking place and, and try and get ahead of it um you know why would you want to work with 
people from, you know, another base in like the Atlantic, et cetera. And for me, this climate change is all about the teleconnection. We're all being um, impacted by that same, um, those same uh, movement of wind that's driving our weather, that drives the circulation in the ocean, affects our our ecosystems. And so we're all in the, this is the, the sort of the band of the, this high level vortex that, um, is changing that that keeps us that's got us all linked and trying to understand as it changes uh what happens with us so i'll just back up a little bit with the iys so wh what was it all about so it's just ending it ended last december after five years and a number of years in advance of that of trying to um trying to uh to tee it up and it was an idea of Dick Beamish's and uh, from Canada, retired now, long retired, but incredibly active uh, a scientist emeritus who, who said to our commission saying, hey, we really need to understand what's going on in the ocean. And we need to get back into the high seas, study these fish. And uh, to do that, we need something like an international year of the salmon to shed some, uh, to open the, to, to make it. To popularize it, make it make it known. So it it went down a, a road of being much bigger than that. Um, although at the core, uh, the need to get back into the North uh, Pacific was actually one of our top priorities. And we've got I see Lori Whitecamps with us, who's uh, one of those few people that straddles the freshwater, the co the uh, coastal and and the high seas in her work. And she's a great scientist and ambassador uh, working with us. So if you get a chance to talk to Lori, please do that. Um, so we took it a little further and because we were heading down this road, the Atlantic folks got wind of it and said, wait a minute, it's over our dead bodies that you will have an international year of the salmon and, and not do some work in the Atlantic. So uh, we worked together um, in teeing it up. And so our two regional fishery management organizations, uh, the North Pacific and Andermas Fish Commission uh, that I work for, and the North Atlantic Salmon Conservation Organization, NASCO, um, 2016, kind of brought the, the, or 2018, I guess, by, you know, completed the, um, and brought the, the IYS into being. It was built around um, five uh, research themes as well as an outreach theme. And I, they're framed in this slide as outcomes, which I think are are really more, uh, uh, you know, and I think the way to look at the world in terms of when you're trying to accomplish something. These are these are states of being that we're working towards. Uh, so under things like status of salmon, the present status of salmon and their environments is understood. And I'll say after five years, we're still got a long way to go, which is the case in most of these um, most of these outcomes. So we set about. Um, teeing up what work we could with not a lot of funding but a but an interest and a desire and and a governance structure which i think is really what partnership is all of, you know partnerships all about uh, a governance structure and it's all about something it's something more deliberate you can have a feel good uh network or a community of practice but a partnership is more deliberate you you're in it to c accomplish something and move something forward and i think that's a really key aspect it's it, it's a nice to have uh idea that we all are connected and that's there's power in that absolutely but i think what we're trying to do here, what PNAMP does, and what we need to do more broadly and could do could do at a larger scale demands uh, a partnership that's um, collaborative. Um, so we, I'll just sort of give you a sense of over those five years, um, you know, where we, some are, uh, we have three priorities, um, and I'll just walk through those. And as I mentioned with Dick Beamish, one was about understanding the winter ecology of salmon getting back into the open ocean so in both basins uh, the pacific and the atlantic um there's since the mid 1990s there's been a poorly understood uh decline in marine survival and uh in some cases for a lot of populations it's been catastrophic and in, in the case of almost the entire atlantic uh, salmon uh, world it is just been a one-way trip uh down uh, and to the point that, um, yeah, it's, uh, there are very, very, you know, the fisheries are almost gone and, um, 
and in the southern end of their range, the Atlantic salmon is is rapidly disappearing. So, uh, but it's just, it's even though we've got the highest numbers of salmon in the North Pacific that we've ever had for a number of reasons, there are still since that mid 1990s um, loss in the southern end of the range, and continuing large big impacts on survival that are taking place, whether it's chum or chinook. Um, uh, pick your species. Um, uh, we have some very serious situations, as this group all all knows. So we did, and I um, get back. We did, or uh, we're successful in going into the high seas. Lori uh, White Camp was um, was uh, part of that uh, um, those expeditions, and I think it's a story. Uh, the science is incredible, and I'm not going to take any time to go into it. But it's about you know monitoring the ecosystem, but it's about bringing five countries and multiple agencies. Uh, together and how do they go? How do they accomplish something like this? Um, and uh, both Lori and I, I think, have uh, whiter hair as a result of what we went through in those in the last couple of years to put these ships uh, to sea. But the result is in, is just remarkable in terms of the engagement of students and scientists. Uh, there was, um, you know, you know, sixty uh, some scientists that were on those ships, uh, you know, technical and scientific staff that were um, were all part of this and continue to collaborate in the results. And I'm now we're now getting you get the exciting part where we've got the data and the and the results and people start to see uh, results and fruits of their uh, this this kind of work. Um, you know, this is just more eye candy i think for but i'm not going to speak to it but just sort of looking across um that survey in 2022 um that went to the westerns um you know didn't get all the way across the uh the north pacific um for a number of reasons related to international uh wars <laughs> and pandemics but you can see the some of the distributions of the species that we're seeing and um you know, this is kind of a teaser about some of the science that we're starting to see uh see there one of our other priorities was recognizing that uh, we really need to start understanding what's going on with salmon by across their life history so end-to-end -end understanding of how various factors are affecting their their uh, survival production, um, et cetera, and a project called the Likely Suspects Framework that got traction in, I think, in both basins. That's um, that is still in its infancy, but shows uh, some great promise. And uh, so I see that as being a critical one. Uh, and the other priority was around data mobilization. Um, Jen mentioned she was part of a really an ad hoc committee that from the Atlantic and the Pacific that we brought together largely as a result of trying to find and, and generate, you know, mobilize data for this end-to-end uh, -end li likely suspects type approach. And they've been meeting every two weeks for better part of, I think, a year and a half. And um, they're producing, Tom uh, Bird is on the, on the call today. And I think, you know, that's just a great, it's another great example of when groups, the, the common purpose and interest work together. I mean, they're writing, um, I think, a, a very key synthesis paper uh, coming out of our, uh, our wrap-up symposium for the IYS that describes this approach to data mobilization that needs to be taken uh, interna internationally. So they gain a lot collectively in bringing it back to their organizations, but they also are contributing uh, to uh, a, you know, a much, uh, a bit of a, I'd say a movement in terms of putting this forward. And there's been publications that they've generated out of it. And, uh, and it's that connection. And one of the groups we have uh, put the Tula Foundation out of Canada has been been um, our partner in the International Year of the Salmon, and we worked hard on generating data management plans and an approach to uh, federate, uh, we call, you know, the data. So we know everybody, even on the five ships, or whether you're monitoring escapement or assessing the state of, uh, of a, a freshwater ecosystem, you know, there's going to be people have already been doing it for some amount of time, they're using certain systems, etc., but we're not trying to, we recognize that we were never, even in, with just the, the data from the ocean, we were never going to convince people to lock, stock, and barrel, go to their own, you know, abandon their current data acquisition systems. Um, but we, um, you know, we did work to develop a standard that we could all agree that the data could be 
converted to or federated. So we've generated from the five countries, five sh multiple ships, three cruises, a federated data set of ocean data that's based on the global ocean observatory system and their essential ocean variables to pull those data in. And, um, and we've now got data sets that all the scientists participating can uh, go to. It's into a, a shared um, uh, repository. And it, it's meeting the requirements under the FAIR principles, which I think this group probably is pretty familiar with. But those were that was key to this work that we're doing. So that uh, will benefit. Uh, actually begs the question for those data how do they connect to the fresh water and to the, as we start to look at the genetic stock id understand what we were seeing in the ocean uh with a group of fish and how it relates to the to the fresh water uh monitoring so there's um there, there are a lot i don't think it's a lot of the people that are involved in this are involved in both the aspects of the fresh water and the and the marine so I, but that is an area where uh, there's there's certainly some interesting work to do as we pull start to pull the data sets together um one of the other priorities was around engagement of indigenous peoples and i think we were the year of the salmon i think was pretty slow in 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 doing this um but i think we finished strong um and i'll talk in a minute about our cl concluding symposium that was held in uh vancouver in october but on the shoulders of that, we convened um, uh, a gathering of indigenous peoples right from right across the northern hemisphere. It was a three day uh, gathering um, and it was strictly indigenous peoples meeting for the first two days. And then there were academics and outside groups invited in. It was held in Vancouver on Musqueam uh, First Nation territory. And uh, there's a pretty outstanding report coming out of that about their intention to continue this international gathering um, with the intent of bringing together uh, Indigenous peoples uh, from both a, a rights and title perspective in in managing salmon, but also how to bring knowledge um, and knowledge knowledge systems together and uh, quite like a approach they're talking about of decentralizing Western science, which was an interesting, uh, really, I think, a, an important concept that they're they're pushing forward. So I see them as uh, this as being a really strong outcome. And I, I noticed your cultural knowledge workshop and I noticed just so many of your updates that ping on work like this that could be connected to other international uh, work that's going on. Uh, but certainly the Indigenous peoples w w was a key one. So after the IYS, you know, we didn't get everything. Obviously, we took on a lot, um, made progress in priority areas. Um, and then in uh, October, as I said, we had a synthesis symposium. And we call it a synthesis symposium because we, we wanted it to be more purposeful, more um, strategic than just asking for papers and then seeing what came and, and publishing it out. Uh, we took each of those outcomes, that uh, the five research outcomes and the outreach theme, and purposely went out and asked uh, experts to provide synthesis papers on progress relating to the, those themes. Um, and so came back. I wouldn't say it was perfect. Um, and, in, you know, it turned out to be harder to do than uh, we had hoped to to um, uh, herd the cats in terms of doing it, but I think it was a really uh, it's an approach that I think has merit that we would uh, like to see continued. And I would say we so we had 200 people in Vancouver with probably a little over a third of them from the Atlantic. And it was an energized room to go through at a high level. Like if you think about topics like the ones you just raised today, hatcheries, cultural knowledge, to toxins, which uh, remote sensing, data visualizations, people are working on those things all over the all over the northern hemisphere in relation to salmon and freshwater and marine ecosystems. And they really want to come together um, to to talk and learn what's going on in other places. And so they suggest that it was pretty strong feedback that a, sympo a synthesis symposium of this type happen every two to three years with a lot of work in, in the interceding time to connect people and bring this work together. They feel the other message was that this kind of collaboration in a time of climate change is foundational. It has to happen. And that the meaningful indigenous participation that we saw in, in Vancouver 
um, was game changing for a lot of people and especially cultures that um, the Northwest, you have a much stronger connection to to try the tribes, et cetera, and it is part of your fabric. Uh, it's not the case in uh, other other areas. And so it was seen both for people that are from um, you know areas where there is strong engagement with indigenous peoples uh, to ones that aren't, they just saw it as being an essential uh, combining those two knowledge systems. And there was support for really that this was urgent and parallel approaches going on uh, around the around the globe needed to be um, having the, the urgency demanded that this kind of thing happen. Um, just by way of example, um, for status assessment and information systems, <clears throat> there were two sub sub themes. And so um, the sub on the right, the status of salmon across the northern hemisphere. So we had papers from the Atlantic and the Pacific on approach. What is the status of salmon? What are the approaches? What can we learn from each other? And again, trying to have synthesis papers where a lot of people work together um, on there's a, you know uh, all of these uh, the presentations that uh, the keynotes that came into here. So rather than it being from one person trying to figure out what's going on around trying to bring groups together. And I certainly see, you know, I see the energy in your groups. Um, it, it's exactly what you're doing uh, in the lower 48 that could be uh, could be leveraged uh, to have engagement going uh, into some of these other other areas. Um, these are some of the topics um, that, when we surveyed the group afterwards, that they felt didn't get uh, enough coverage. And so climate change and habitat alteration, impact of salmon enhancements and aquaculture. Um, so you, you can you can read those. But it just said, hey, we learned a lot, but there's a lot more we want to be coming back into the room to understand at a, at a sort of a, a hemispheric scale what's going on. Um, so that's wrapping the IYS. It's it's all about it's it's a. It's a, as I've said, it's about partnership, it's about people, it's about collaboration. Um, it was about li literally, I, 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 we should, I hope we'll add it up at some point, but literally thousands of meetings uh, and, and with people and engagement, bringing people together across the basin um, and making the introductions. Uh, so how do, how do we formalize some of that, that governance? Um, on this hemispheric scale, a lot of this, there, when it comes to climate change, you know, we certainly have rooms like uh, the COP meetings and places like that. But from an operational perspective, how do we regularly have some connectivity between the type and on the type of work that we're doing? And this is focused on the marine, but I got to say, we are not just focused on the marine. We really want that habitat, uh, freshwater component uh, to it. So. All of these organizations, uh, the regional fishery management organizations under the UN, like ours, uh, NASCO in the Atlantic, the North Pacific Fisheries Commission, which does everything in the North Pacific besides salmon. Uh, you can see <coughs> uh, the Pacific Salmon Commission that, excuse me, that most of you will be familiar with. Um, they're now in the process of having bilateral arrangements, and, and we've always had these things. Hey, you get an invitation to our meeting, you know, you'll get one from us, et cetera. Uh, but they're putting more formal uh, memorandums of understanding now, but usually one to one. I think these things need to be connected um, where we have multilateral arrangements between big science organizations like Pisces and ICES in the Atlantic and the Pacific um, and and uh, and these uh, regional fishery management organizations. And I, I would say, you know, thanks to to Steve uh, Waste and others, we've having a conversation with USGS about, you know, what would this look like on the freshwater side from that agency's perspective and connecting to um, to to others uh, to the fishery side. So this there is, a, I think, some governance that uh, steps that we're going to continue to push coming out of the IYS um, to uh, to formalize these so. The IYS and the connections that were built just don't fade away. Um, and I want to just quickly speak about um, a project that we're currently in the process of, of building out. Um, it's called Becky Basin Scale Events to Coastal Impacts. And uh, even though it's focused on the ocean, again, I want to say that the intention is that 
Uh, salmon would be an exemplar in this, but it is not just about salmon. And it's not just about the ocean. It's making that connection to, uh, to fresh water as well. So um, uh, Pisces, uh, Sonia Batten, executive uh, director there. And uh, there's a small group of us that are listed there uh, in the title or just below the title that have been working on this. It was a project that got accepted by the um, by the uh, UN and the International Oceanographic Commission uh, as a UN decade project. As of yet, it doesn't have um, any d dedicated funding associated with it. It'll run through the course of uh, the decade or held a series of workshops. Um, Lara Erickson's on the call today, and Pacific States has been uh, interested in, and uh, in this as well. And so it, it, we're, we're building it out. So what, what is it? It builds on what we've been taught, what we started with the expedition and getting out there and showing that a partnership in the open ocean can work. But, you know, one, tr one, one trip or three trips, three years doesn't, you know, really uh, eco understanding the ecosystem and how it's changing and what it's going to do to our coast, how the open basin affects the coast uh, doesn't happen. You know, it happens over time. So let's build out um, a system and we're calling it an intelligent system. So think about the weather and how our weather forecasts are generated from from you know meteorological monitoring satellites um, uh, through a modeling process to give us likelihoods and probabilities of conditions uh, happening in our weather and uh, and to our to to people. This is the same thing building. How does that open ocean? How do those systems, weather systems, impact the ocean, and how in fact in turn does that translate and impact what's what's going on in the um, in the coast, in our fisheries, in our communities? So um, we're looking at implementing that sy a system of monitoring research and analytical approaches that that provides that timely advice about the impact of changing uh, climate conditions on our social ecological systems. So there's not, you know, I'm very familiar to this group. <clears throat> there's some amount of uh, a modeling. Uh, sorry, that's that. I think the modeling is at the core of this thing. Large scale uh, climate models that now tell, you know, we're all pretty familiar with their. Um, so I see I've messed up intelligence there. Good. Um, so the the modeling uh, of the the climate, how it's changing, and those can be downscaled to give us. Uh, higher resolution in terms of spatial and temporal resolution to help us understand whether it's what's happening in watershed reaches, uh, main stem flows, coastal systems, estuaries, and the high seas. And it's about trying to <clears throat> enhance the monitoring, in particular in the uh, in the coastal and the high seas, um, to to uh, provide allow those models to, to understand, uh, to, to allow those models to become skillful and then translate them into out, outputs, link them to how our ecosystems are changing, what it means for uh, the growth, the survival um, uh, of our fish, and ultimately our fisheries and, and communities. So those are just some of the examples of the data from the, the big climate models that we hear about. And, and the middle one is getting uh, downscaled to give you higher resolution and start to type of thing we're looking at to overlay on our understanding of what's going on with the fish we see in our surveys and where we know our salmon are out there. And then the one on the right is just a proposed large set of these data models that you could uh, pick your area of interest and work from. Right now it's being done in very selected areas uh, depending on people's and organizations' interest. So those are the kind of the, these are the areas that are sort of central to Becky. Uh, as I said, I think the modeling and prediction is at the core of this. Those those technologies make the connecting the physics, the weather, the changing ocean to our animals, and uh, whether it's in freshwater ecosystems or in the ocean, that's at the core of this thing. The technology's there. Uh, the monitoring is going to be really essential and what's going to make it possible in the open ocean is high technology. So the, the use of satellites, the use of, of autonomous systems, whether it's drones, uh, gliders, drones that are combined and can work as gliders um, and to augment the a limited amount of work that we can do in ship time can actually make it cost effectively be done. 
And the lower right, data mobilization and synthesis, to, to make this happen, uh, we can't be sitting on our data. The data all have to be integrated. Uh, they have to be talking to each other and they need to be federated. And then we need targeted research to make the link the mechanisms to the fish and the animals that were of interest. And all of this demands a huge amount of connect connectivity, dialogue, uh, communications and outreach. So we're in the process right now of developing uh, a science plan. We held four workshops to, uh, around the proof of concept um, that were really successful. And uh, I can give you a link to, we've got reports, almost got the full suite of reports ready in a, a blog for you to have a look at that. Um, we're in the process of still working, bringing together clients, partners, um, and ultimately funders but our focus right now is is bringing experts together to develop the science plan and that uh, our hope is that that will convene in uh, March. So my next two slides are kind of uh, where where do we go from uh, here and, and help facilitate um, conversation with with you folks. Um, I think just to sort of reiterate, where does aquatic partnership make sense? So if if you're working if you're working on anything, whether it's uh, hatcheries, uh, the, the toxins, all the things we heard about in the updates today, if there's people working on those elsewhere, it makes sense that there's some capacity to share uh, at least uh, progress methods. So you have a community of, of practice that can work together, and the closer you get, and, and it could be that you actually have a partnership at that level to work on where it makes sense on methods. And some of these say for our project for Becky, these downscaling methods, we're going to be collaborating with people across the northern hem hemisphere to make sure we're, we've got the latest approach uh, down for that. So the development of methods for this process that I'm, we're talking about in Becky, ecological forecasting of extreme climate impacts um, for marine and freshwater ecosystems um, that have shared and integrated atmospheric drivers. So if you're losing fish as a result of an, something that's happening in the open ocean, that's a shared uh, un, you know, um, set of piece of research that ideally you'd be part of a partnership that's on top of that, as opposed to trying to make it happen in near real, uh, re, near real time. Joint monitoring of shared ecosystems. You know, we've been talking about, we got a couple of people from BC here, and I know you guys have reach uh, looking at the, the Dell work down into California, um, but we're working within shared uh, ecosystems, whether it's the uh, Columbia, shared interests in the Fraser transboundary populations, uh, et cetera. So it, it makes sense that we're working together uh, because of those shared geographies and uh, in case some overlapping management systems like the Pacific Salmon Commission. Um, development of enhanced monitoring technologies like sitting the Eddie's conference was fantastic and I think that the Eddie's we talked and we did bring some of the groups together in the international symposium we had um, tried to connect the Eddie's uh, process um, but, you know, you can't be everywhere, but, you know, some people from the eddies process could be in, in an international sort of forum that allows you to facilitate some connectivity between the two. Um, and so I think that's the kind of place on these new technologies. You don't have to be in every room, but you need a process that helps make it uh, connect them. Uh, development of shared data standards, repositories, and approaches to data synthesis. That's part of what you guys are all about. And I just think it, it's so important that we um, that we push that push that forward. Uh, the development of ecosystem modeling uh, coupled to with end to end day, end to end life history management strategy evaluation models for salmon. I think that's something we're all uh, in a need in a need for and there's a lot of great modeling being done in the Atlantic actually out of France and trying to keep those people connected with uh, with folks in the uh, Pacific or is an area of interest and in, and in development and and stuff PNAP does is going to be the the data and the the monitoring that actually drives those kinds of uh, things so uh, Jen and I did have a bit of a chat about some of this uh, and she's got um, she can add as well uh, to this, but some actions I think to to discuss uh, build on, you know, how can we build on existing data systems and structures uh, to allow for evolution. Uh, certainly, I think 
Jen and I are on the same page as our sort of international group on developing this federated approach um, to bringing data together. Engage in the establishment of an international network to collaboratively develop methods to monitor and assess the status of aquatic ecosystems. Uh, engage in the development implementation of BECI. You know, we're you know this will be implementation plan and funders will, will all be sort of coming together over the next 12 months uh, coming out of the science plan, and there could be an opportunity to engage um, PNAMP in. Um, in the freshwater uh, you know, side and test out approaches. Uh, at the end of Becky, ideally we're left with, a, with working systems that continue in perpetuity. So it could be an opportunity for PNAMP to test drive um, some broader connections. And I guess with that sort of cheekiness, uh, kind of point to expansion of PNAMP to engage uh, BC, Alaska, uh, and beyond. So with that, I'll, um, I'll turn it over to Jen to see if I you know, she's got anything to add, and we do have a couple of other uh, slides that uh, speak to some other potential connections. So, Jen, thanks, Mark. Um, wow, yeah, that was amazing. The the work that's gone on so far for IYS and setting up for Becky, and um, I think most of you heard me uh, or probably received a, a link from me during the North Pacific expedition was the boats were moving. You could see them and the sail drones and the, you know, it was very exciting to watch the data collection. So th there's, there's a lot, Mark, Mark talked a lot about what's happened and all the things in motion. And it, it, part of why we're here today is that it just sounded very familiar to me over the last year or two listening. And it sounds a lot like what we're trying to do here. Um, and so it's natural to think about what we could do together, right? It's been the whole premise of PNAMP is to try to collaboratively, voluntarily bring people together who have shared challenges. So that if you recall back, I'll have to say it, 18 years ago, <laughs> we started PNAMP. We had the idea that people were sitting at their desks, you know, individually trying to solve problems and we would try to bring them together and the PNAM staff, as you know, just facilitate all the expertise from the partners coming together to do stuff. It's, it's not it's not a staff, it's all of you out there. So what we're just trying to figure out, um, what what is it that we could do and how how would we start? Um, there's, we obviously invite, we always invite uh, any participation to PNAP activities and we do have a pretty broad participation. And of course, we're going to continue to do that. Um, but we are obviously thinking something more structured um, might be more effective uh, down the road at actually changing things for the better of the planet, really. Um, I know, big, another big goal. We've always said that with Peanut. We have these really big goals, and we try and chip away at it each year over time as what the partners want and need. And so with that, I'm going to just open up for discussion. 